<laughs> all right. I don't know if that was for me or for the for the sermon bumper. <laughs> Thank you. I humbly accept. All right. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Randy. Like I said a couple moments ago, Pastor Eric is on vacation, which is kind of uh, awesome and kind of funny because I texted him earlier this week and I rubbed in the fact that we were having probably better weather than he was down south with these like 90 degree uh, days. I saw people swimming in Hamanassets. They were they're out swimming in the ocean. Uh, they're, they're brave. They're brave. But it is officially springtime up here in Connecticut. How many people's favorite season of all the seasons is springtime? Can I see some hands? Babe, I see you. Me too. What about summertime? Summertime peoples. All right. Fall, summer. There you go. Fall. Fall. That's my second favorite season right there. But it's too close to the next season for it to be my favorite season. Winter. And it, where's the winter people at? They're like, hmm. Winter favorites. Ah, I see one. There we go. Yep, I saw that. A couple over here. Yeah. Well, it is spring. Spring's officially here. I, I am thrilled that spring is here. I love it. It's my favorite season. Um, but spring nowadays reminds me of something that happened a couple of years ago, just two years ago. It was actually the event that kind of germinated, that kind of kick-started uh, our transition from our other church over into this direction. We were living in a, in a condo, and we're renting it. And this is like uh, spring 2021. So it's right after like the, the peak, peak, peak of COVID and going through the winter there, coming into the spring. And I got a phone call. Uh, it might even be this day, two years ago. And the landlord of our condo said, listen to me very carefully, Randy. I have looked at the housing market. I am seeing dollar signs like crazy. You guys need to get out of my condo so I can sell that thing. And you guys need to get out as fast as humanly possible because the property value of this thing is skyrocketing, right? And, uh, he felt a little bad, but, but not really because he was just like super excited about the kind of money that he was going to be making. And I can't really blame him, but at the same time, I was on the receiving end of that phone call and I was thinking, oh no, like what are we gonna do? I got, I got two little girls at home, my wife, and it's obviously moving is a, is a big deal. And so we, you know, the guy was like, the timetable is like as soon as humanly possible. So we started to kind of go out and check to see what was out there. We looked at rentals. And if anybody was looking for rentals or trying to buy a house during the peak of COVID, you know what I'm talking about here. It was impossible, impossible. Rentals were like ridiculously sky high priced if you could find them. Houses were insane. They're still insane, but they were like crazy insane because it was going up like 20% every like couple days. It was just through the roof. So we're going to see, you know, different houses and stuff. We're going to do showings and, and we walk into these places and the place isn't even nice and they already have like eight offers on it and they're cash offers. People are just showing up, just throwing money and getting these houses. People, you know, you know, a lot of you know, buying houses sight unseen, that was a trick. It's like if three houses were up over there and you wanted to live in that area, you'd like, you just put, you just put a bid on something. And then if it came back to you and you went in there for the first time and you're like, okay, we got the house. I don't really like it. Then you would just pull back your bid and it would go back on the market. People were being slimy, you know, in those days. Uh, we did the same thing anyway. When we, <laughs> uh, but we were going, <laughs> we were going around. We were, we were, we were at first very optimistic. Oh, God's going to, you know, God's going to provide us a place and we're not going to, we're not going to be left alone and, and God knows where we're going. And then time starts ticking and we're visiting all these different houses and doing all these different showings. And I remember one in particular where we went in and we're like, okay, this place is kind of nice. And, and we, we were the, we were the last showing before they were going to make a decision on who was going to buy the place, right? Who was going to get the place. And we put in our offer. And my real, our real estate agent, agent like laughed and was like, you are like the 10th of 10 offers and all the other ones are way higher than you because they're giving cash and they're giving way beyond asking value. So I left that and I was, I was, it was kind of like a slap in the face, like, a, like cold water or something. Cause I thought, you know, maybe there was a chance. There was no chance. And so I remember getting in the car with the family and, and, and we turned around and we, as we were leaving, the actual homeowner was arriving at home and he was, he was uh, getting out of his car and he was walking over to the mailbox. And I'll never forget the look on this man's face as he got home and realized he had 10 offers on his house and it was like way beyond asking and there was like cash and all this stuff involved. This man was walking to the mailbox like this with like a huge smile on his face, so happy. And as we're driving by and I'm looking at that man's like huge smile and he's so ecstatic, I'm starting to feel the weight of this pressure of like, okay, this is, the, we've seen a bunch of houses. We've seen a bunch of places. All these doors are closing in our faces. We got these two little girls, beautiful little girls. They're three and five years old. What are we going to do, Lord? Where are we going to go? So the stress, like, notched up a little bit more. Now we're in, like, desperation time. Landlord, hey, what's going on? Like, you guys got to get out of there. Okay, okay, okay. 
So now we're, we're on the clock. Clock is ticking, trying to take off time from work to go to showings, try to get out early. Oh, we got nobody to watch the kids. Let's take a three and a five-year-old into somebody else's house and hope they don't touch everything. And you're just like walking behind, stop touching that. Stop putting that in your mouth. Stop touching that. Stop putting that in your mouth. Stressful. So stressful, right? And uh, so we're praying though. We're trying to pray. We're trying to believe God. We're trusting God. God, you got a place for us, right? You know, you know, Lord, which, what, where we're supposed to end up. And it was kind of funny because there was this one house that I actually saw by myself. It was the second of like 30 houses that we saw. It was the second one that we ever saw. And I went by myself because I didn't think my wife would go for it. It was actually in the woods, like off the beaten path. And when I went to that house, the presentation wasn't great. It was like a lot of things were overgrown. So in the front yard, it was like six foot tall. It was like actually eight foot tall grass. It was taller than me. It was huge. And there was just, it was just kind of unkept. It was left to go wild a little bit, right? And I'm thinking, there's no way I'm going to be able to convince my wife to move into this place. Oh, the house is all right. Um, but I was like, nah. So we left. We saw all these other, you know, all these other houses. And then it was kind of like, what about that house? What about that second house? It's still on the market. What about that house over there? And I'm thinking to myself, well, that's in Bethlehem on top of everything else. And like, isn't that ridiculous? There's no way that God's going to be like, I'm going to take the pastor and I'm going to put him in Bethlehem, right? There's no way. There's like eight people that live in Bethlehem. There's no way that's the house. But as we're going around and we're struggling and we're stressing and we feel like the heat is getting turned up on it, we're like, we need to take another look at that house over there in Bethlehem. And even going in and walking around, it's like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But suddenly, all of a sudden, it was like, it felt like, it felt like the peace of God, right? My wife and I went to visit that house one day, and it felt like the peace of God was like, God was almost telling, almost, almost to that point. You ever heard that before? You don't quite hear it, but it's almost like you, you hear it. It's like, this is the place. And it was crazy, because it felt like the star was like leading us to Bethlehem, like so weird. So we ended up, we ended up buying this house. We bought this house in Bethlehem. And how many of you know, if you ever bought a house before, that actually buying the house is the easiest part? Because <laughs> then you have to go through all the stress and the mess of moving into the place and fixing stuff if it's broken. And it was an eye-opening experience for us as first-time homeowners that if, the, if the, something happened with the, with the toilet or something, right? It's like, I can't just call up my landlord and be like, hey, sorry, man, toilet's broken. Now I'm picking up the phone, calling myself, being like, Randy, <laughs> toilet's broken, buddy. No, tell me it's not true having to figure it out, the worst. Now I'm the person that I call. That's what being a homeowner is really about. So we get in this house and we're kind of going through a lot of the stress of moving in and, and finding out that, you know, anytime you move into a place, there's gonna be something that you didn't catch that's wrong with it as you, after you get in. You're like, oh man, I wish we caught that in advance. Well, everything was going decent for us until a, you know, a week or two later and then it rained really hard for the first time. Then I went down to the basement one day, <laughs> and it was crazy flooded. <laughs> and, and then in one of our bedrooms, I realized there's like this patch, and it's growing in the ceiling. And it's, what is that? Oh, it's water. Wonderful. The roof is leaking. And then, and then when it was crazy raining, I saw outside all the gutters were crazy, just overflowing, just like pouring all over the place. They were crazy clogged, and they weren't set up really correctly. And the stress of like actually owning the house and living in that house starts to ramp up on me. And then, I, then we're trying to, trying to move my girl, one of my girls into her room that we chose for her. And as we start to get in there and redecorate the room or, or just start to maybe paint the room and stuff, it's like, what's that? What's that? And my wife being Colombian is like, uh-oh, she puts on like her Rambo thing. I'm going to find out. And she's like, it's cat pee. <laughs> Terrible. Cat pee is impossible to get out of carpet. Let me tell you, she was in there. She was taking out everything that she had, trying to clean that up as good as she could. And it was just like a nonstop battle. So hard to get that out of there. And then the boiler, it wouldn't turn off. It was on like constantly all day long. And I'm just thinking of all these like dollar signs of all this like gas, this fuel being burned up because I don't, like, I don't know why it's not turning off. And it was like problem after problem and stress after stress and all this stuff. And I started to, your boy, Mr. Pastor Randy, <laughs> Mr. Spiritual, started to be like, God, why did you bring us to this place? Where are you? Why would you do this to us? Why, 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 why did you make us go through all this stuff just to put me here and just, you see what's going on. This place, this place stinks. Why did you bring us here? Why don't you just let us stay where we came from? Right? I was so quick to doubt him. Right, we're praying all these like, you know, real powerful prayers of faith. Oh God, we trust you. We trust that you know exactly where you're going to bring us, that you had this house ready for us before we knew we needed a house. And then a month after being in the house, I was like, Lord, are you sure this is the house? 
I'm a little salty right now. I'm a little upset about this. And as I was going through this time of doubt and grumbling, I came across this scripture in my reading, and it's Hebrews chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. And it says this, it says, Jesus has been worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. In other words, if somebody has a really beautiful house, right? We might admire like, oh, that's an awesome fire pit. Oh, that's an amazing looking whatever, lanai or something, right? Oh, this is a really cool house. It's just beautiful altogether. But really, the person who built that gets the credit, right? The person who had the skill to, put, to bring something like that together gets the credit. The house may be awesome, but somebody actually built that and put that together. Super cool. And that's what this is saying here. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. And as we dealt with those beginning issues when we bought that house and started to kind of check them off and, and go through them, and some things actually like just got resolved like kind of easily. And I realized that, hey, this actually, this stuff that in my mind was stressing me out and, and was causing me to grumble and doubt God's goodness and wonder where he was and why he would drag us to a place like this. All of a sudden, it was kind of like a, a, a reverse Uno card, right? And I was like, oh, this is about my heart. This is about me going through a little bit of a test and failing the test, if I'm honest with you, turn into grumbling complaining because then I started to realize to myself, man, he had it under control the whole time, right? And I'm supposed to be a pastor. I'm supposed to be like the spiritual example. And as soon as stuff got tough, all of a sudden, a lot of that scripture that I know just whew, right out the window. Where are you? How could you? Why was I so faithless? Why was I so quick to grumble? He knew this was going to be our house. We've been praying about this house. He knows we need a place to be, Right? He knew the landlord was going to call us up and be like, get out now, now, see ya. He knew that. The Bible actually says that he knew me even in my mother's womb. He was there like knitting me together, even there, right? So why was I so faithless? And then I started thinking about, I remember the, the very first night, and I'm not going to always tell these stories. I know the first time I preached was like a month or so ago, and I told a lot of stories, just so you guys would get to know me. Right. I'm going to throw out another story from my past. I'm not always going to bring up these stories, but this one is kind of pertinent, right? You'll see in a minute. My very, very, very first night on the streets, your boy, old Pastor Randy, some 20-something years ago, I was down there in Phoenix, Arizona, and I, and I got off the Greyhound bus, the Greyhound bus world tour, I like to call it. I was on that Greyhound bus, and it was like days and days and days and days, and no showers and zigzags, no, not really having a destination in mind, but landing in Phoenix, Arizona, and that's where I ran out of money, baby. So that's where I was. And I remember not having a place to go and spending the entire night in the Greyhound Terminal in downtown Phoenix, a city I'd never been to in my life. And I remember walking by a payphone, no money, not, didn't know what to do. And as I was walking by the bank of payphones, I saw a little business card. And I looked at it and I took it and it was something for a homeless drop-in center, which is like, it was explaining if you need, you know, if you need to take a shower, you need some food, if you're in between the ages of 18 to 22, and I was then come on, stop by, you can get a shower, you get a hot meal, you can get some bus tickets, and we'll, we'll take care of you during the day. It's like a day drop-in. So I said, all right, like that sounds great. I'm gonna hoof it. So I walked for like two hours in Phoenix sun, and never, the Phoenix, like 110 degree weather or something, never experienced that in my life. And I'm walking and I found this place. And I walked into this place and I saw a couple other people, young people like myself, was like 20 years old at the time, and I just latched onto the first one that was kind of nice to me. And I just depended. I knew that I was going to need somebody to kind of guide me around my first night in this city. And I was kind of hanging out with this guy. And after the, the drop-in center closed and we went outside and there was like, all right, see you later. Good luck, everybody. He, was, he said, all right, come with me. So I walked with this guy and we went, to a, uh, we went outside of a grocery store. And I hung out next to him as he, as he picked like half-smoked cigarettes out of the ashtray and started lighting them up and smoking them next to me. And he started hitting up people as they walked out of the grocery store, started hitting them up for spare change. And I was like, man, I've been on the streets for about 10 minutes, and I, I know, uh, I, I don't know if I'm okay with this. Like, I'm, I'm from Connecticut. I'm kind of like, I don't know, I don't want to be associated with, like, hitting people up for a spare change coming out of a grocery store. But that was my life. That was my life in that moment. So he got some money doing that, and then it became later and later. And he's like, listen, I, I, you know, uh, we, we sleep in the park. I sleep in this park over here. So we go into this park, and it's a big park. And we're there, we go to a water fountain, 
and get a drink. And all the way across the other side of the park, there's gunshots, blam, blam, blam. All of a sudden, a car screaming down the road, taking off. And within like two minutes, the helicopter's in the air and it has its big spotlight and it's in the park. It's looking for all the stuff that happened. All the police are showing up. It's my first night. I was blown away. I was like, where am I? This is crazy. And because this park was huge, he's like, well, I actually sleep over. I've been sleeping over here in the, in the, in the, in the playground. Okay. He says, but there's a guy that's kind of like, we kind of fight over the same spot, and he's mad I stole his spot underneath the slide. I was like, all right. <laughs> so we come to the park. It's, it's pitch dark. You know, there's a couple swings, a slide. It's not very big. And he says, I'm going to sleep underneath the slide. And I'm thinking to myself, well, if the guy's angry at you for sleeping under the slide, I'm going to sleep up top of the slide. And it was one of these twisty slides, right? One of these slides. I don't know if you remember, like, these kind of metal twisty slides, right? So your boy, who's unfortunately tall, went up to the top of the slide, and there was nowhere to really lay down. So I jammed myself uncomfortably, kind of like on that first area, down, and I jammed my heels into that first turn of the twisty slide. And that was my first night on the street. And I realized that the desert is not warm at night, it's cold. And about three in the morning, I couldn't take it anymore. And I slid down my little slide. <laughs> and we, uh, we walked to stay warm, and we ended up spending the rest of the night in the, in the ER waiting room, just pretending like we needed to be there because we wanted to stay warm. That was my first night on the street. And even then, when I was homeless on the street, God knew his plan for my life. Do you understand? He understood me. He knew me. He knew I didn't even know him. And he had a plan to take me from homeless to homeowner someday. He had my life in control. He knew from the beginning, knit me in my mother's womb. So why am I so faithless? Every time the going gets tough, I got to grumble. That's unbelief. That's actually sin. So God was dealing with me hard on those days when we bought the house. I was homeless, didn't even know him, but he had a plan for me. It seems like every time something happens in my life, maybe some other people is like this. Every time something happens to me in my life, I'm immediately tempted to be like, why me? If I'm not careful, I will take a blessing and start calling it a curse. So finding this verse was a great reminder to me that none of this is a surprise to him. It's all in his hands. And it goes on here in Hebrews 3. It goes on the next verses 5 and 6. It says, Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. So Moses is over here, and he is prophesying, talking about what God is going to do in the future, right? Right? It goes on, but Christ is faithful as the son over God's house. So Moses is pointing to the future, and that future was Christ. He was the fulfillment of all those prophecies. Moses, the servant in the house, but Christ is the son, the owner of the house, the builder of the house. And this is where it gets a little trippy. Because it says, Christ is faithful as the son over the house, And we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Moses the servant, but Jesus the son, God's house. It's interesting because like a lot of times in church, we'll we'll talk about like, oh, the house of the Lord. And it's like, you know, the church, it's the building, it's the four walls. And we talk about, I'm going to the house of the Lord. And, And that's cool. And I think there's some precedent for that. But sometimes we can, we can believe that a little bit too much because really is the implication of that is like God is hanging out in a building during the week alone and lonely waiting for his people to come visit him on a Sunday morning because God's house is a building in four walls and he hangs out there. Is that true? He don't hang out in here waiting for somebody to show up and he's bored waiting for his people to come worship him. The crazy thing is that he actually lives inside of us. Right? It says that right there in that scripture. We are his house. He lives in us believers. 1 Corinthians 6 says this. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you received from God? Famously says you're not your own. You were bought with a price. What was that price? Well, we talked about that last week. That price that Jesus bore going to the cross and the grave. 
that blood that was shed for you and for me, that body that was torn up for you and for me, that was the price. God becoming flesh and submitting himself even to death for you and for me. Therefore, honor God with your bodies, it says, because you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You're bought with the blood of Christ, and now the Holy Spirit dwells in you as believers. He knows what we need, right? If he dwells in us, he knows what I need. He knows what I need oftentimes, all the time, before I even know what I need. He knows better what I need. He knows what we're going through at all times. In fact, he's right there with you in the boat during the storm, even if you're tempted to think he's not listening and paying attention. He's there with you through the storms of life, whatever you're going through. That's Jesus right there with us. But how many of us are going through trials while holding firmly, that scripture said holding firmly with confidence, even though the storm comes, even though the trial happens, even though the heat turns up a little bit, are we holding on to Jesus confidently that he's going to get us through no matter what happens? That's where I was fumbling. Hold firmly is the trick. It reminds me a little bit of, the, uh, of my first truck. I had, a, I had a 1980 Datsun pickup truck. Yeah, yeah, a 720. It was like a overgrown roller skate made of metal and rusty. But baby, you get that thing up to about 60 miles an hour and you're driving somewhere and you take your hand off the steering wheel and that thing will start to veer left, like pull left pretty good. You ever had a car that does that? Maybe somebody has had a vehicle. That, I've actually had a couple that did that, if I'm honest. You take your hand off the steering wheel when you get up to a certain speed and it starts to veer a little bit left or a little bit right on you. Well, that's how life works with us when we take our eyes off of Jesus Christ. When we start relying a little bit too much on our own understanding, leaning on our own understanding and relying on our own strength. We take our eyes off of Jesus and maybe we don't realize it because it might be slight at first, but we start veering and veering and veering. And next thing I know, I'm over in the bushes somewhere going in and out all the grass and heading off into the woods. I took my eyes off of Jesus. I took my eyes off of Jesus. When I start doing things on my own, trusting in myself, that's when I get in trouble. Hold firmly. And it's so easy to get off track. It's so easy to take our eyes off Jesus. There's distractions literally everywhere. We carry them around with us. So easy. So we bought this house, right? And as I mentioned before, it was kind of overgrown when we bought it. A lot of the, I think the reason that nobody bought it, honestly, is because Nobody spent a little bit of time just to clean up, basically clean up some weeds. If you clean up the yard a little bit, make the presentation a little bit better, maybe slap a cheap coat of paint on the inside, it would have been, the house was only 20 years old. The house was actually built when I was on the street the same year, which is crazy. And God knew. And God knew. We bought this house. It's got a little bit of land, but it's just completely overgrown. And in the front yard, you know, I have this, this giant weed patch, like eight feet tall. And in, in, in front of that, there's these giant pine trees. They're probably like 80 feet tall or something. They're huge pine trees, big. And as I'm walking around the property and I'm starting to cut down, you know, I'm trying to weed whack some stuff. I'm starting to pull up poison ivy by the roots, right? Because I don't have goats, which is apparently how else you're supposed to take care of poison ivy. So I'm pulling up by the roots and I'm pulling up vines and I'm pulling up weeds and I'm, I'm cutting down all this overgrown stuff. And I start looking at these big trees that I have. And I see on those trees... I see like all these like little vines that are kind of hanging from the trees. And as I start walking closer, I start seeing that some of them aren't that little. These are like some big vines and not even like that and not even like that. But some of, I found one that was like this big, a vine on a, on a tree. And when I started looking, I realized that those vines actually go all the way up to the top of those trees, like 80 feet in the air. And you can look at the tree, and sometimes, like, you see beginner vines, and they're super tiny, and they're just crawling up the side of the tree. And then you get the super old mature vines that are huge, and they're on that tree. And what they actually do, I learned because I Googled it, is that those vines will climb all the way to the top of those trees, and then they'll spread their leaves over the tops of those trees and actually block out those trees from getting sunlight because now the vine is taking all the sunlight for itself with its leaves. And over time, they will actually choke those trees to death. Even though they're big, strong, super tall trees, them little vines 
can get up in there and grow and choke out the life of something much bigger than itself. So your boy out there is cutting vines off of trees and pulling up weeds and trying to pull up a poison ivy without getting it all over myself. I did it a couple times. <laughs> Weed whacker, shorts, ran on the poison ivy. I was like, do I have fleas? Nope, it's just poison ivy literally everywhere. Great. <clears throat> But I was out there pulling up the weeds, cutting the vines, chopping down this like overgrown area of grass that was taller than I was. And I was feeling like Adam in the garden, honestly. I was learning so much out there. I felt like I was tending this, this, this lawn, this place that God had given me. I felt like I was in the garden. It was crazy. And I learned some stuff. I learned that if you let things go overgrown, major problems can start happening in your life. What start out as little weeds and little vines can eventually grow up and choke out your life. And there's a lesson in that. And God's got me thinking as I'm out there like Adam in the garden. I'm thinking about my hang-ups and my issues and the stuff that's growing in my heart. Is there something in my life that's choking out my life? It was blowing me away. The worries and the hangups and the weeds that I allow to grow up in my heart. Adam was in the garden, but in a way, I'm gonna break the, in a way, we are too. Actually, your, your life is like a garden because you cultivate your life in a way, right? You reap what you sow, the Bible says, right? For example, if you spend a bunch of time on social media every day, you sow your life and your time into social media. I'm talking hours a day. What are you going to reap from that? Weeds? Let's, let's, let's use a positive example. What if you spend your time and you sow your time and your life to learning a skill? Let's say it's like carpentry or something, and you learn a skill, and you spend your time, you sow your time into that. What are you going to reap? The ability to make stuff with your hands? the ability to build things, the ability maybe even to make a living. So you can sow your life in one type of thing or another type of thing, but you will reap what you sow, says the Bible. Your life is like a garden. Now, if you sow all your time drinking alcohol, getting high, watching pornography, and again, I was homeless. I'm not judging, all right? But there's truth in this. We're going to reap what we sow. We're, we're sowing seeds, and that fruit is going to grow in our lives. And not all fruit is good. Some is poisonous. Real problems and issues, weeds and thorns and parasitic vines, they might start small and harmless, that might be under control for a little while. But the goal of sin is to take you over and cut off your life. Galatians 6, 7, and 9 says it like this. Be not deceived. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. It's in Scripture. It's how he created creation. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let's not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. But it's so easy to give up. But doesn't that sound like it's a garden, like your life is like a garden? It's talking about reaping and sowing. It's talking about you can, you can sow into your flesh, but it's always going to produce destruction for you. But you can sow into your spirit, and that's going to produce life for you. Some of you might know, maybe, maybe from kids' church, I, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't learn this until much later, but the fruits of the spirit, right? Stuff like peace and joy and love kindness and goodness and self-control. We sow into the Spirit. Well, how do we do that? Spending time with God. Seeking time in His Word. Coming in sometimes on a Sunday morning and saying, God, I got no agenda. I don't even know this song. I don't know the words, but God, I'm just here and I surrender. 
Search my heart, God, if anything is growing up in there that's trying to choke me out that you don't want there. Whew. Pull up them weeds. Sow into your spirit. But it's so easy to give up. It's so easy to take our hands off the wheel, to take our eyes off of Jesus and start veering, start veering off the road. So easy to have our hearts hardened to the things of God, the distractions and the worries that we put our focus on. It's human. I got a phone, man. It's very easy to be distracted. But it's the distractions and worries and things that we put our focus on rather than God. We will reap what we sow. Let's go back to Hebrews there, that Hebrews uh, chapter 3, verses 7 to 9. Of course, this is talking to the Israelites, right? It's called Hebrews, talking to the Hebrews. And our, we're not really Hebrews by birth. But the Bible also says something interesting. It's kind of garden language too. It says that us as believers are grafted onto the tree of Israel. That means in a way it's like they've broken off and we are kind of grafted to that tree. So when we read this in verses 7 to 9, it says, So as the Holy Spirit says, who what dwells inside of us as believers, remember? As the Holy Spirit says today. Is it still called today? Right? We still call today today, right? Okay, so well, let's, let's read this. Today, if you hear his voice, well, I guess that's me, right? Uh, it's all of us. Don't harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion, as they did in the rebellion during the times of testing in the wilderness where the Israelite ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. And what did they see when they were out there in the wilderness? What did they see God do? They saw him deliver them from slavery and death in Egypt and judge the biggest empire on earth. They saw him bring them through the desert and open the Red Sea so they could pass through. They saw him lead them through the desert by day in a pillar of cloud and at night in a pillar of fire. They saw provision, like basically food falling from the sky for them because there was nothing to eat. And now God was providing for them. They saw water being provided them in the desert when they were thirsty and it was brought forth from a rock. They saw all of these things, but what was their response in these tests that they were going through? If you read the scripture, it was always to grumble. It was always to grumble and complain. God had just brought us through the Red Sea, but now we're thirsty. Where is this God? He brought us all the way out here to die. It's better we go back to Egypt. Forget this Moses guy. Let's find somebody else. Let's go back. It was so much better in Egypt. At least we had food to eat and water to drink. But maybe if they just spent some time and reflected and remember and what God had brought them from and delivered them from. They could say, Lord, you are the creator, the maker of the heavens and the earth. You parted the sea and rescued your people. You brought water from the rock when there were no way for water to come from that. You did it, God. That you would provide now in our need when we need food. That you would provide it, God. Instead of grumbling to trust God. Because these were tests. And I was faced with that test when we moved into that house and things were going wrong and I failed it. And God brought me to this scripture, this passage, and it blew my mind because God is that good. He didn't want to leave me out there in the desert. He wanted to call me back into his faith, right? Into, into believing that he had not abandoned me. I grumbled at every stop. They grumbled at every stop. Sometimes that's what God does. He'll throw out a little test and we go through a trial and it's really to see, are we going to trust God through it? When that storm kicks up on that sea and Jesus is sleeping in that boat, he's down there somewhere. Are we going to freak out and think that, well, Jesus just, he has abandoned us. He don't care about us. Oh, he's right there with you, right? Sometimes it's a test. We got to look through and keep our eyes on Jesus, even in the trial. I don't want to have a hard heart, a hard heart full of unbelief. Hebrews 3 goes on, 12 and 14, 12 to 14. He says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you 
has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Because you got to catch it. Sin will deceive your heart. It will choke out your life. It'll deceive your heart. Sometimes you'll be deceived and you won't even realize it, but it was because of sin in your life and it's blinded you. And now you're not looking to God anymore. And now you've kind of been deceived and now you're veering off course. You don't even know it. That's sin's intention is to do stuff like that, to harden our hearts against God. Has anybody ever sinned and knew it and then all of a sudden had a hard time looking God in the face and asking for things in prayer? Yeah. Yeah. Because sin is trying to harden our hearts and trying to put up that blockage in between us and Jesus. That's the goal. You messed up. You're not good enough. You stink. God don't want nothing to do with you. Look what you did. You can't. You're not good enough. You think you're good enough to talk to God. Why does God want to hear from you? You're a loser. You're nothing. You keep messing up. Sin, boom, sets up that wall. You're right. I start believing it. I can't look at God. I can't, I can't go to him anymore. I guess, I guess I'm just going to, I guess I'm just going to exist over here now. It says, we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. Again, with that holding on to Jesus firmly. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. What's wrong is wrong and what's sin is sin. The weeds of sin. You sow sin, you reap hardness of heart. You reap the weeds and the parasitic vines. I've had this happen to me. The weeds of sin so easily entangle. They might start out small, but they want to take you over. The Bible says we got to cast off that sin that so easily entangles. we got to get it off of us. It doesn't matter how it feels. It doesn't matter how we feel about it. And somebody might say, well, pastor, I'm a man, and I just love women. I love them all, pastor. I love them all. And I don't care if they're single, if they're married. I just love women, pastor. Why would God make me like this, pastor, if he didn't want me to be happy? I think God wants me to be happy. Therefore, I think he wants me to be with whoever I want to be with. This is why we're supposed to subject even our desires to the lordship of Christ. Because that's deception. That's sin deceiving hearts. That's why Christ first and our desires a distant second. If he's God of my life, I got to give him all of me. Even when it hurts. Whoever sows to the flesh from the flesh shall reap corruption. Your life is like a garden. Don't allow the weeds and the thorns and them parasitic vines to choke you out. So I'm going to leave it with this, with this passage of Scripture here. This is a parable, a very famous parable that Jesus shared. He shared it to a whole crowd. And it's about something super basic. It's one of the most foundational, most basic things in all creation. And I think that's why he shared this parable. Because for all ages, it was going to make sense to people, even thousands of years later. It's a parable about a, parable about a farmer, a story about a farmer who goes out to a field and he's got his bag of seeds and he starts to sow his seeds, right? And even thousands of years later, like we're familiar with the idea of like farmers and seeds. And he says, he doesn't give, he tells the whole story. He tells the whole story, but he doesn't tell the crowd. His disciples come later and they ask, hey, what's that interpretation? What is that story all about? And his disciples receive this from Jesus. Jesus tells them, that farmer from that story, that's me. And that seed is the gospel of the kingdom of God. And that word that's being sown is like evangelistic. It's getting into people's hearts. The hearts are the ground where that seed is going. And he says there's four types of ground in a way, four types of ways to receive that seed, that word of God, that gospel. And he explains it. He explains it here in Matthew 13. He says, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, 
the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown where? In their hearts. This is the seed sown along the path. He goes on to the second one. He says, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, what happens? They only last a short while. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. I remember when I first came to be a Christian, I started telling, I didn't know any better. I told all my non-Christian friends, Jesus, 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 Jesus. They were like, get away from us. Uh, that's probably happened to some people in here. You became a Christian, you started telling people, and they're like, oh, you're a bigot now. Great, like, case closed. We don't want to talk to you no more. There are many people that at first it's, yeah, but when those little persecutions start to happen, it's like, hmm. They fall away. The seed, the third way, falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out. They choke out that word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one that produces a crop yielding a hundred or sixty or thirty times what was sown. One seed oftentimes will bring up a plant. In this case, it's like one seed being like thirty, sixty, a hundred times more abundant because God can cause an overflow of abundance from just a little bit of faithfulness. This is the same God of the miraculous, right? The same one that, that healed the lepers, the same one that multiplied the little bit of bread and the little bit of loaves and fed like 6,000 people. The same God wants to do a work in your life and my life. And he just laid it out right there. Some people, when they hear it, they don't understand it, and it's gone. It actually says the enemy, come take it away. Some people, they hear it, but they got rocks in their heart. Sometimes that can be unforgiveness, I think, as well. I just can't. Some people, it's the distractions and the worries and being consumed with wealth and chasing after money and power and fame. And it's like thorns and thistles in our life. And it chokes out the word because something else has the seat of the throne on their heart. But today I want to believe that everyone in here at least would be willing to pray the prayer of Jesus that I would be that good soil. There's a lot of things in my life that maybe I can't, I feel like I can't change. I feel like I'm out of control in some areas. Maybe something has control over me. Jesus, I don't want the worries of this world and life and sin to choke out your life in me, God. I want to be fruitful for your kingdom, Lord. That you would use me, even if I'm the least likely. That it's not about my strength, it's about your strength, Jesus, in my weakness. Father, I pray for your life today, God. I pray for your ears to hear your word today. I pray that if anyone needs to examine their hearts, that we would all examine our hearts, Lord, and you would show us the weeds that have taken root, Lord, if there's any, that you would help us to pull them up, that you would uproot what doesn't belong in our hearts, God, that you would cut and free us from any of these parasites and vines and whatever that would take us down, Lord. Help us to be fruitful, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, God. Be that good soil and you do the rest, Lord. Multiply, uh, multiply yourself in us, God. Multiply that fruit in us. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. Amen.